the Civil War, the Air Force was born. And as early as 1898, the War Department showed interest in the glider. But it took a pair of clever bicycle makers who tinkered with a man-carrying kite to add imagination and power. Wilbur and Orville Wright gave the glider a water-cooled engine of their own design and two chain-driven eight-and-a-half-foot pusher propellers. The toss of a coin in 1903 at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, won Orville Wright the chance to be the first man in history to fly under power. Airtime, 12 seconds. Distance, less than the length of a B-36 wing. Wilbur Wright went to Europe in 1908 to find a market for the flying machine, which up to then they were unable to sell. His flights on the continent attracted the president of France, as well as the kings of England, Spain, and Italy. To Wilbur, it was endless work. In addition to acting as pilot, he was ground crew, mechanic, and salesman. A team of horses pulled the plane to a wooden monorail. This was to serve as a runway on the grassy field. Lifted by a few men, the flying machine was swung into position facing the wind. To provide thrust for the takeoff, the Wrights had developed a weight-falling catapult. After the props were spun, the engine kicked over. Wilbur and his passenger, a French journalist, took seats on the lower wing and braced themselves for an exciting ride. He convinced Europe, winning applause, but no sale. Back in America, encouraged by President Teddy Roosevelt, the War Department opened bids for a heavier-than-air flying machine. Signal Corps specifications required that it carry two persons a distance of 125 miles at an average speed of 40 miles an hour. The Wright signed a stiff contract. Finally, at Fort Myer, Virginia, they flew a machine that was accepted as U.S. Army Airplane Number 1. By 1913, 41 Army pilots were decorated with these gold military aviator wings. Among them was Lieutenant Henry Arnold, who later, as commanding general of the AAF, led two and a half million airmen to victory. Another aviation pioneer, Glenn Curtis, also built early Army trainers. Soon, more inventors improved the machine with tractor instead of pusher propellers and the Army began to see the new airplane emerge as a weapon. By 1916, our only trained aviators were a few Americans flying with France, and they made us proud. They were the famous Lafayette Escadrille, started by Norman Prince, William Thor, Victor Chapman, and Bert Hall, who courageously fought when Germany had full control of the sky over Europe. When German U-boats forced us to declare war, American air power ranked 14th. Believe me, we were far from ready. I was a rookie cadet, I ought to know. They gave us wooden guns and told us we were going to turn the tide. You know, in a couple of weeks, we began to look as though we might do it. With training equipment, we molded our own bombs out of plastic. Pretty soon, we trained with the real things, Lewis machine guns. Having met the requirements, we were issued leather flying togs and helmets. Assignments were made. We got a chance to fly. First, we made a pre-flight check of the bailing wire planes. Then we tried our wings. Fifty hours in the air, a few bombs. We were checked out, ready for advanced training overseas. America was producing airmen, but we didn't have a single fighting airplane. Only a few of our leaders were wise. Newton Baker, Secretary of War, was one. He insisted Supremacy of the air in modern warfare is essential. Woodrow Wilson was another. 
The president asked for $600 million to meet the needs of military aviation. Meanwhile, Red Cross girls saw us off on our way overseas. Since Congress couldn't vote us time, we went to France without airplanes. But we did go in style. Camouflaged luxury liners like the Leviathan were used as troop ships. Some of us half-trained flyers went to Britain and Italy, but most of us went to France. There we found cities of wooden barracks and muddy streets. In outdoor classes, we practiced gunnery. Wooden models helped us learn how to lead a plane with our fire. Battle-tested aviators took time out from the war to show us how to handle the stick. Finally, we soloed. The first ride was always a thrill and a bumpy experience. However, it was much easier to talk about turning the tide and to produce fighting aces overnight, even if some of us were lucky. Late in 1917, France met the AEF's first Aero Squadron, commanded by Major Ralph Royce. His outfit was the first to see action, and they proudly pasted paper iron crosses over enemy bullet holes. Our commander was Colonel Billy Mitchell. America's first flyers were there, General Benjamin Falloy in command of supply and schools. Colonel Thomas Milling, head of air service units, 1st Army. And Colonel Frank Lahm for the 2nd Army, commanded by General Bullard. When Major William Thor and the Lafayette Escadrille became the 103rd Aero Squadron, they brought a record of triumphs. Thor, five German planes down. Lieutenant Larner, three. Lieutenant Merrick, one. Lieutenant Tobin, three. Don't forget the aces. Captain Field Kindley with 12 victories, and Major Raoul Luffberry with 17, before they were both grounded forever. Then those who lived to take part in another war, Captain Elliot Springs with a score of 12, and the ace of aces, hat of the ring Captain Eddie Rickenbacker with 26 victories. America's airplane factories and us war workers didn't get started until late. To make airplane wings, they took us house carpenters, furniture upholsterers, even seamstresses with high pompadours. Meet Rosie the Riveter, 1917. Painters use varnish that smell like bananas. The fuselage, which we finally chose, was a British design. The engine was all American. Its manufacture was the outstanding production achievement of the war. In all, 4,500 DH-4 airplanes powered by the Liberty engine were put together in this country. They were built by Ford, Lincoln, Cadillac, and Packard, automobile manufacturers. Curtis, Martin, and Wright, still famous plane-making names, were busy assembly plants in those days. World War I gave America its great aircraft industry. Each plane was test flown. Then, the thousands of parts were painstakingly dismantled for packing under guard. Crated and addressed, it was off to the front. In France, husky mademoiselles handled the wings like toys. Here, parts were reassembled into the fighting craft, which helped sweep the enemy out of the sky. May 1918, and the first American DH-4s rolled directly from assembly sheds to the airfields. Only eight months after they were ordered into production, they joined American aviators ready for the big push. When the order to prepare for battle was given, truckloads of aerial bombs were delivered to the planes. There, armorers fused the bombs and loaded the racks. Then the boys who had to take them up made sure the job was done right. The boys still talk about the big push. When we lifted the flaps that September morning in 1918, everything was ready. Billy Mitchell had asked for every Allied airplane that could fight. We brought them out. 
The brass ordered a tremendous air force to control the skies over the Samahil sector. This was the first army's field of battle. For the dawn takeoffs, we put flares on our wingtips. Every allied field on the continent gave its planes. General Mitchell called for 1,500. We actually got 1,481 off the ground. Wooden props bit into the air and the engines began to rev up. Our mission was to protect the doughboys of the First Army. Some had orders to bomb and strafe enemy installations, others to engage the Germans in the air. This was it. Each pilot had been carefully briefed for his part in the mission. U.S. aviators in 609 American planes, now a solid part of Allied air power, rose to attack. Germany put albatrosses, Fokkers, more than 30 different types of planes in action to fly no man's land patrols. Some of the Huns dropped bombs by hand on our troops. With over 120 different types of aircraft, the Allies fought back. Our boys were always quick to single out the enemy and come in close to attack. The German was hurt. He tried to escape, but couldn't make it. Our pilot signaled that he had made another kill. And after a victory roll, he rejoined his buddies. Other enemy ships strafed our observation balloons, burning them out of the sky. Allied air power struck back in force. The sky was a beehive of battle. We overwhelmed their air defense, winning and holding air superiority. It was almost the same a few weeks later in the Meuse-Argonne offensive, where we bombed with telling effect in the most notable aerial effort of the war. November 11th, 1918, closed a chapter in the unending story of the United States Air Force. Visual history has shown us some of the courageous men in uniform and out who cradled the dream of flight and gave us aviation. In the history-making jobs that lay ahead is the inspiring chronicle of more Americans who continued the pioneer spirit. Men with an idea who planned and worked and fought to build the greatest striking force and protective power in history, the United States Air Force.